Without further ado, we got Mr. Stephen Droz somewhere back here. Come on out. Well, my father um, was an incredible musician. He started playing professionally when he was about 16 years old. And he played clarinet and saxophone. And he played all time polka music. And I basically, those are my first memories. He, um, that's just, you know, polka and waltz music. That's the very first thing I remember. And it's still one of your favorite forms of music? Um, in some ways, yeah. I don't, I don't seek out new polka and waltz music, but uh, I <laughs> certainly like my dad's old records because it's just such a great memory, you know. Right. The drummer, who my dad called, a, my dad called him a pill popper, his name was uh, Billy Ray Mladenka. <laughs> wow. And he didn't show up for the gig one night. And so my uh, dad... He, he's going down in history now because this will be all over the internet. In a couple Billy of Ray Mladenka, yeah. And so um, my dad called from the VFW hall, wherever they were playing that night, in a panic. And he told my stepmother to tell me to pack up my drums and get my butt down there. And that, that was it. I just, I played with the band that night, so... And how much did you earn? I think the first, when I first started, I would get 50 bucks a night. Which, when you're 11 years old, is a lot of money. <laughs> I think when you're, when you're 18 and going to college, it's a lot of money. Well, it was, you know, candy was very important, you know, and my own clothes. I, I had, you know, I look like a slob now, but I used to be kind of a snazzy dresser when I was in sixth grade. So. Well, the did first you... 45 I bought was a song called uh, Good Time Charlie's Got the Blues by Danny O'Keefe. Some wow. of the older people here might know that song. It's a really sad, depressing... Can you play it? I don't, I don't actually have it with uh, me. And I thought you, it, you could just... You know. it's, it'd be a boring thing to play. It's just yeah. this really sad, depressing, uh, early 70s song about a loser that regrets most of his life. And this is, you know, I was five years old <laughs> buying this. I don't know. It sort of set the tone for the rest of my life, maybe. I don't know, but... <laughs> um, and I remember the first... Because uh, you were going to ask me the first... Well, I was going to ask you the first yeah. record you stole from a family member. Cause it was. It was the first Kiss record. Um, the very first one, the classic cover, the four faces and the black background. I stole that from my brother James. And what drove you to steal that? Was there a song? Was there a moment on that record where you're like, this, I've, I've got to have this? And... Well, I should tell the story. Um, my brother, my oldest brother James, we worked out a deal by the time I was seven that if I made his bed every morning and cleaned his room, he'd let me come in his room and listen to his records. And that stemmed from the kiss incident because I left it in the back of my mom's car in an accident I, I, and it warped from the sun. So trip. I'd go in his room every morning, I'd make his bed, clean his room, and I had access to his whole library of records, which was incredible. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> and I just started getting really curious about the keyboards because a lot of the stuff I was listening to had keyboards in it. Like, you know, Journey was real popular at that time. Even the police and a lot of the new wave that was coming out had synthesizers and stuff like that. And I think that's what sort of first got me interested in the keyboard. And then. I remember um, one of the guys that played with my dad, his name was Tony K, which is weird because the original keyboard player for Yes was named Tony K. Anyway, this guy was incredible, and he taught me my first major seventh chord, and it, it blew my mind, you know. Wow. And um, from then on, I just, I started, I would check out theory books from the library and just learn whatever I could and just play to the radio as much as possible, so. You were driven. Yeah. So from, yeah. from drums to keyboards, and then when, when did you start playing guitar? Um, I remember my oldest brother had an acoustic when I was even very little, when I was like seven or eight. I remember I would just sit on his bed and just pick the open strings because I liked the way the strings sounded, you know. Uh, but I think I learned my first few chords when I was 13 or 14. You know, were you already familiar with the lips before, you know, you met Wayne here? I was, but only recently. I'd only uh, really discovered the band. I was in a band from Norman called Janus 18, and these guys were complete lips heads. They had all the records. And was Trent, th was that Trent? Trent Bell was in the band yeah. originally, yeah. Um, and that's, that's why I ended up moving back to Norman's, because I lived in Austin with those guys, but that's a whole other story. But they had turned me on to the Flaming Lips, and I had heard them before, didn't really care that much about it. And then when the record, uh, did you I'm hear that just, one? I'm just yeah. being honest. But then I, I did like one million billionth of a millisecond on a Sunday morning. That's a mouthful. I'll try to say that slower. No, you caught that. Yeah, I, I love know. that. Yeah. But I didn't really know the other stuff so well. And then the record um, in a priest of Nameless came out, and that completely blew my mind. So, and that's when I became a committed fan. And um, well, I tell that, a story. Yeah. When I first moved to Norman, I was so broke that I collected aluminum cans to get money to buy my Taco Mayo every day. You know, that's what I lived on. <laughs> And uh, the can recycling place was right by Wayne and Michelle, so one day I was walking past with my two garbage cans full of 
uh, beer, empty beer cans that I collected from people's houses, and Michelle was in the front yard. She was just like, wow, man. The homeless guy. And then two months later, I met their house drinking coffee. You know, it's yeah. a pretty good story. Yeah. <laughs> Kind of scary. So, um, yeah, I joined in uh, October of 91 is the month that actually was. So, well, you know, how? So, and the weird thing is that Wayne had seen a videotape of me playing with Janice 18. So I think some show in Dallas or something. And then right after that is when Nathan left the band. And I met him the one time over at, I'm trying not to, I'm not, I don't want to go off the rails here. Um, I lived with a guy named Robbie Egley who had a recording studio that the Lips had recorded demos at. So Was that Alien? Alien Studios, yeah, yeah Alien in New Orleans. And I swear, I think Wayne doesn't remember this, but the very first time we met, he asked me if I knew the song Hello, It's Me by Todd Rundgren. And I had literally just learned that song a couple of days before that on the guitar. So you passed the audition. It was just the weirdest random thing. Yeah. You know? And so the next time he came over, Nathan had quit. And in the meantime, he'd seen this video of me playing. And he asked me what I was doing. I was like... I'm washing dishes at Legends, and I really hate it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I went and jammed, I guess, lack of a better word, with, uh, with well, Michael and Wayne, just the three of us. I, I'll never, or did you just naturally kind of fall into place? And um, it, it never seemed awkward to me on any level, even though they were older than me. Uh, Wayne's eight years older than me. I think Michael is, well, he's seven. So is he six years older than me? Um, actually, the, the funny Michael story is that I was in the band for about a month before Michael and I ever had any conversation. I loved playing with him, but I was very... He's kind of quiet. Yeah. I was very frightened of him. He just wouldn't talk, you know. And one day, can I just tell these stupid stories? I love this. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> so one day we had practiced, and I only, this is just a few weeks in, and Wayne had to stay in Oklahoma City to do something with his dad, so Michael and I were riding back to Norman by ourselves, and I was, ugh, I was afraid. And <laughs> about five minutes in the drive, he lights up a cigarette, and he's like, did you ever read about... Uh, the tests that the Nazis did with uh, using audio to destroy buildings in World War II. <laughs> I was like, no, tell me about it. And that was the rest of the drive. My wow. I, I knew I was in. Two days later, I was watching uh, Apocalypse, Apocalypse Now. Now on Laserdisc at his uh, apartment in I Norman. Mean, so there you how, go. Was, how was touring back then? I mean, when you guys went out on the road, you know, in that era of the Flaming Lips career, was it, uh, did you have a bus? Did you, were you going out in, in, right. you know, in your own well, cars? You have to understand that when you're 22 and you're going doing a na national tour with who's, who was previously your favorite band before you joined, you, you don't really care about the condition, how the conditions might be. You know, you don't care. We at that time we had a blue van with a trailer, and the band was in the van, and the gear was in the trailer. And now we have sometimes two tour buses. You know, that's just the way it goes. You know, the operation gets bigger and expands. But those first couple of tours was just uh, the old blue van. I think had like a million miles on it already, and a trailer and not really much road crew to speak of, just a couple of guys that help us drive and set up. And, but that first few years was, two or three years, whatever, was so exciting that that, that sort of propels you along. You know? that, propels you, that, that keeps you from thinking about, is this going anywhere, or should I get a real job, or should I have gone to college, or whatever. You, know, you don't think of that stuff. You just, you're completely living in the moment, especially, I keep saying that age, but it's true. You know, I'm 40 now, I was 22 at the time, and just the fact that I was getting in a van and driving across the country and playing every night, that was the best thing in the world, you know. With Soft Bulletin compared to our last record, it's like, wow, that's the same band. That's strange, you know. And a lot of people might see that as not a good thing, like, oh, the Ramones, they had one style and they never changed. It's like, well, I don't really care about that, you know. There are people that, that, that will do that and can do that, but that's one of the things I love about the Flaming Lips is they're just constantly mutating into something because we just, we really do love music and we're just always trying to get that new thing that's in our head that we're not sure what it is, you know. So touring or recording, which is your favorite? They're both stressful and can be fun. <laughs> the thing about touring, actually playing music, I love that, but it's, and you know, like I said, we have two tour buses and we fly a lot of times and we stay in nice hotels, but you know, I have a wife and two children now and really it just, man, just being away from home is really a drag. Yeah. And, uh, but if that doesn't bother you, man, touring is, is pretty cool. So. so that hour and a half here on the stage is great or horrible? Um, it can be both, really, and at the same time. Cliff and I, and Wayne all, as well, talk about the, I think I had the theory about the three levels of your... I'm uh, ready for this. Yeah, and the students will think this is interesting. There's three levels of where your, your psyche can be while you're performing. If you're lucky, the top tier is everything is going so good and everything sounds so good and you're playing so good, you're just enjoying being in the moment. You're not thinking about what you're playing. You're just, you're just playing and it's working out great. The second level is... 
something could go wrong or you feel like something's about to go wrong, so you're very nervous and you're not really enjoying the show, but you're not playing badly either. And then, then there's this, the, what I call devolving into complete fear and apathy. And that's the lowest level where something is going wrong, you're not playing right, you're playing bad notes, and it sounds bad, and you're just, you're so panic-stricken, like I was right before this started, but now I'm okay. But those are, the, <laughs> those are sort of the three levels. You know, if you're lucky, that top, that top tier can happen every now and again, where you're just completely enjoying yourself, you know. We had a couple of moments with the, the Pink Floyd Dark Side when they were like that for me. Oh, that's, just that's sheer, cool. sheer enjoyment of, the, of playing music. So. Well, I think it's funny how... Yeah. So, as a, as a... Are you more of a fan of music now than you were growing up? Less of a fan of music? Has it changed your perception of just sitting and listening to music, being so involved in it? And that's, a, that's a really good question. Uh, I think we actually called this... Uh, don't we call it the, the stairway to heaven theory? Um, a lot of music, once you figure it out, it kind of can lose some of its appeal. It's when you don't know what it is that makes it so magical. And that is certainly true of, well, I'm not going to play stairway to heaven because it's been a while, I'll probably screw it up. But I remember, you know, being, when I first was learning guitar, it's like stairway to heaven, what a weird, even though it's overplayed, you know, and it's just, it should be in the classic rock vault. It's like, what is going on there? And then I figured it out and it didn't seem nearly as cool after that. And that has happened with everything from that to some of this symphonic music to some of the jazz music that I actually would sit down and start to learn and figure out. But then you don't hear it for a while and you come back to it and you love it just as much as you did before. So um, I would say I'm as much a fan of music, of music as I was, but I just understand it a lot more. So some of that magic is kind of gone, you know. Um, I still think we really need to work with a real orchestra one of these days. We really need to do that and see what the possibilities are. You mean recording or live? Uh, actually, just recording would be fine with me. Just the experience of getting to hear what it sounds like in the room with this music that you've composed. You know, it involves uh, yoga, honestly, a little bit of bourbon and a cigarette. That's what's up. Usually in that order. So, I do like I, if I can. I do about 15 minutes of yoga, and then I have my whiskey and my cigarette. And it's my dad. You know, he quit smoking years ago, but even just to the, up, up to a few years ago, he would have one cigarette before a gig, and that was it. Only when he was playing.